Hi everyone. Hello. My name is Christina Lopez uh, and we are with an organization called STEMS Grow. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to be teaching your kids all about coding on the Scratch platform. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to introduce uh, STEMS Grow, the organization, as well as any... Well, we know okay. the audio is working. <laughs> Um, so my name is Christina Lopez. Um, I uh, founded Stems Grow about uh, four years ago, and we became a nonprofit organization in 2019. So um, we are registered 501c3, an official charitable organization. And I am here with Emiko, uh, and I will give her a minute to introduce herself. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. I am a soon-to-be junior at CSUCI. I am currently majoring in mechatronics engineering with a computer science minor. Um, I'm really passionate about computer science. It's something that I really love teaching and learning about. So being able to partner with STEMS Grow and work on creating lessons for young students to be introduced to computer science is really, really awesome and really fun. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is going to be great. Thank you. And we did do uh, the same. The lesson that we're going to be doing today is going to be an introductory lesson for uh, the Scratch platform, really just to get your kids familiar with the basics. And they will be developing some basic code today as well. The feedback that we got from the families who joined yesterday were was that even after the event ended, they continued working on the Scratch platform for hours. So we're really, really encouraged by the feedback. We know your kids are going to love it. It's going to keep those brains active, engaged all summer long. So we're really excited. And thank you again for being here. Um, so we do have the chat opened up for this event. So if any questions come up, if you run into any challenges, um, please feel free to post into the chat and we can help you through those challenges. If you're watching this as a recorded session, then feel free to reach out to us by email at info at stemsgrow.org. You can post to us on our Facebook page, send us a message. I think with all the technologies these days, there's plenty of ways to get in touch with us. So no worries there. Um, at the end of the event, we are going to be sending out a survey, um, so I do ask that you complete the survey and provide your feedback on the event. Tell us what you think, and if you share your email address with us, uh, you're going to see some notes that Emiko put together for this lesson, and you can receive a copy of those notes uh, after the event wraps up. So again, just put your email into that survey and we'll send you a copy of the notes. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Emiko and you can go ahead and get started. Thank you. Awesome, okay, cool. I'm gonna go ahead and start off with explaining kind of what we're gonna be using and what we're gonna be doing. Uh, we have this platform that MIT actually created called Scratch. It's a block-based programming platform that is really easy to use. It's really good for intro. Okay. It's really good for introductory introductory uh, programming, especially for younger students or students who have a not, no experience yet. So this is what we're gonna be using. Um, I do have a set of notes that I'd like to go over first. Um, right now, there are a few different basic controls that are used in Scratch. For example, let me just go ahead and show you the Scratch platform again. On the left-hand side over here, you see there are like multiple different circles of different colors. And these circles are actually going to be really important when we wanna choose certain uh, blocks to be used in our program. So we're gonna go ahead and look at the notes again. I'm going to explain the basic controls, the different tabs that we're using and how we can use them and what we wanna do eventually. So the first tab is the blue circle, which is motion. And this tab is used to control how a character moves, um, in what direction, if they're turning around, and just those very fine specifics. Um, in Scratch, the characters that we're using are called sprites. So I might be saying that a lot, and I want you guys to know it's just the character that we're using. The purple circle is the looks circle. And this is a collection of blocks that controls how the sprite looks, if it has a different costume on, if it's saying something, so it has a little speech bubble, or if it is thinking something, it also has a thought bubble, and also the backdrop, which is also the stage of where we're gonna be setting our game. 
the pink circle over here is uh, dealing with sound and these blocks control the different sounds that could be played um, if they can be played all the way through or stopped early and this is also in conjunction with the sounds tab which I'll be showing you later and the sounds tab is used primarily for um, when you want to play sound and you want to edit it first you can also record sounds which I think is really awesome for Scratch to have the next event uh, the next block that we're going to be using is events and these are blocks that control when a group of blocks goes or when certain blocks are activated so an event would be something like uh, hitting a certain button on your keyboard that's an event that the computer recognizes and can then complete a certain action or maybe make a sound depending on if you hit that button or not the next tab that we have is control the orange one and these are very specific to um, really breaking down different actions in programming so these control loops they can they control waiting and they also control if if then and while loops and statements I'll be explaining if, if, then, and while loops a lot more later, but um, just to give a basic preview now, an if then is a very fundamental uh, statement that we use a lot in real life. So if your mom asks you to go to the store with her and she says, if there are avocados, please grab some for us, right? Put it in the basket or whatever other actions you do after you grab the avocados. Um, it starts with an if, so you have like an unknown in your scenario, then a condition, and the condition is if there are avocados, so if you see avocados in the store, then there is a following series of events or motions that you're going to be doing, like grabbing the avocados, putting them in the basket, and then helping your mom through checkout or something, that follow the if-then statement. So this is really important in programming because when you code something, you have to break it down into really, really simple steps because the program can't read your mind. And it's really easy to just think, oh, yeah, just do this, this, and this. The computer isn't that smart. We think it's super smart, but it's only smart because people help make it that way. So when you want to do something in a programming language, whether it's Scratch, which is block-based, or something a lot more um, difficult to use, you can you need to really break it down into every single step that you want it to hap that you want to happen before you're allowed to like run the code. Um, the light blue tab is for sensing, and this is really important in real life scenarios. Um, as someone who works with robots, I have to use sensing, um, like coding, a lot in my work because it's essentially these blocks help detect if a sprite is touching or saying something and it also does time and stuff but that's not what we're really getting into today but it's kind of like when you're making a robot and you really don't want it to run into any walls so what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that it senses the walls before it hits it you'll either have like a camera on there or an ultrasonic sensor which detects how far away the closest object is to it and being able to use these sensing guidelines, these, these sensors on the robot, can actually protect your robot a lot so it doesn't accidentally slam into a wall every five minutes. Next, let's talk about the objective of the game that we're going to be writing. Uh, it's summertime, we want to play on the beach, and we want to have fun. So we're going to be playing with Sarah the Starfish, and she loves to play fetch. So we're going to allow her to move around and to get a ball. We're going to let her celebrate when she gets a ball, and we're going to move the ball around as well. There's also going to be a challenge uh, to this program that I'll talk more about at the end. So if you have any older students or kids who feel like they, they want a challenge, you know, this will be for them. Um, the points that you'll be learning really today will be how to move a sprite, how to bind keys to certain movements, and how to make a sprite appear on a random point on the map. And if we go into the challenge, you'll start using variables, which are a little bit more difficult, but a lot of fun. 
So the first thing we're going to do is um, if you do want to uh, get these notes for yourself so you can look over them or maybe challenge yourself in a different way with them, uh, your parents can actually help you fill out a form that will be given at the end of the live stream. And with this form, you'll be able to really go into like, you'll be able to get these notes and we'll also be able to get understand like what you guys thought of the video and everything, which is really, really helpful. Um, okay, we're gonna go into the uh, Scratch platform right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and click here and we have Scratch set up. So the first thing we do, there's a lot going on on this page. That's okay, we're gonna break it down. Like the tabs that I talked about before, they're all over here on the left hand side. So when I click on looks, all these purple blocks show up and I can change the looks of the character and so on and so forth, depending on which tabs you're using. These last three operators, variables and my blocks are a lot more uh, challenging, especially for an introductory course. So we're just going to be using um, sensing, control, events, sound, and motion. We're not actually going to be using looks. And we're going to use these to, um, to make this game, okay? The first thing that we want to do is we want to change the backdrop. It's summer and we don't really see starfish on like white tables or anything. So we're going to go ahead and change the backdrop to a beach. Um, in the lower right hand corner where my mouse key is, you can see there is a stage section uh, with backdrops. So we're going to go ahead down here, click on choose a backdrop. And right up here is the beach in Malibu. Really beautiful, really awesome. Look, there it is, all changed up. Now, I actually haven't seen a cat on the beach before, so we're gonna change it to the starfish. We're gonna go ahead into the sprite section over here, which is where our characters are. Gonna go ahead and delete the cat. So now the cat's gone, but we're going to choose a sprite and add a new one. Because there are so many sprites to choose from, because Scratch really wants you to have all the options available, we're gonna go into the top tab and click on animals. So we'll find specifically the starfish that we want. All these different animals here, scroll, scroll, scroll until we get to the starfish. Click on the starfish and now Sarah the starfish is on our map. Perfect. Uh, we also want her to play fetch with a ball though. So we also need to add a sprite character called ball. We're going to go back down into the lower right hand side Click on the choose a sprite option. And the ball is actually right here because it's sorted alphabetically. Click on that. And now we've added the ball. Something really important to go over just um, to kind of understand a little bit more about Scratch is that when you click on the starfish or the ball, either on the map or on um, the lower uh, right hand side, it's going to change the image up here in the coding uh, workshop area. So when I click on the starfish and the starfish shows up here in the white um, block area, we we're actually only writing code for the starfish. When I click on the ball, the ball is going to show up in the corner. That means we're only writing programming for the ball. This is really helpful later because we're going to have to differentiate between the two because there's going to need to be code for both of them. However, the first thing we want to start with is we want to get Sarah to move. Uh, right now, we don't have any keys bound to any movements with her. She's just standing there, which is awesome, but we want her to move. So the first thing we want to do is we want to bind a specific key to Sarah's movement. And let's make the first movement up. So we want Sarah to move upwards. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go into events on the left hand side, click there. We're going to find the when space key pressed tab. We're going to click and drag it into the blocking space. Now we can use this space key, but I decided that I want to make W my up key. I'm going to go into this where it says space in the little down arrow, click there and go ahead and scroll all the way down to W. There you go. Now we have when 
W key pressed. Right now, there's no movements to that. It's just the starting event activation trigger, right? We have something that when we press the W key, we want certain code to follow. So the, the code that we want to follow is going to be a motion. Right now, uh, Sarah's facing to the right, which is awesome if we want to move right. But since W is our up key, we want her to move upwards. So we're going to go into motion on the left hand side, the blue circle. And we're going to scroll, look down and find point in direction 90. Now this is really helpful because when we click on the 90, it's going to give us a circle. This circle is a little bit like a unit circle where this is zero, uh, straight up is zero, this is 90, um, to the right is 90, all the way down is 180, but when we go all the way to the left, it's negative 90. The first thing that we want to do though is we want to make the arrow pointing upwards. So when we click on W or we click on this block, Sarah's going to move, Sarah's going to point in the direction zero. So I'm going to go ahead and click on W and Sarah is pointing upwards, which is awesome, but she's not moving. She's just turning in a direction. What we want to do next is we're going to want to go back into the blue blocks because it's still a motion control, right? Grab move 10 steps, place it underneath and make sure you get that highlight area. So it definitely clicks into place. Change 10 to 30 because that's a nice number and 10 is a little slow. Now, when I click on when W key pressed or when I click on W on my keyboard, Sarah is going to move upwards, which is exactly what we want. However, just for uh, looks purposes, I want her to face back to the right so she's not just staring up into space. We're going to go ahead and find point in direction 90 again. Click and drag that until we get the highlight underneath. Let it attach to the larger chunk of code. And we can keep this facing 90 because remember Sarah started off facing to the right, which is the 90 degrees. Go ahead and click W on your keyboard or tap on the W key up here. And Sarah moves upwards and she faces back to the right afterwards. This is exactly what we wanted today. Okay. Now that we have the up key, we also want to use the down key because we want Sarah to be mo to move all over and the four directions we want her to move in is up, down, left, and right. For the down key, I want to bind it to the key on my keyboard S. Um, in a lot of video games and also other like other games and maybe other movements that you're playing. Uh, I don't know if anyone plays Minecraft or any, you know, other type of video games that uses a keyboard or is played on a computer. Um, you move with your left hand on the keyboard and W is being pressed by your middle finger, S is being pressed by your middle finger, and those are up and down. Your first, your index finger is pressing on D, which is to the right and your ring finger is pressing on a um this is just really common in a lot of uh, computer video games you don't need to play video games obviously to be able to do this but it's also a fun thing to learn because it makes it a lot easier uh later on so that's how we're going to um key bind so use these keys and bind them to specific movements that we want sarah to do so when I click on W, Sarah's going to move upwards. My next goal is to make Sarah move downwards when I click on S. So the first thing that I'm going to do is again, I'm going to go into the left hand side, click on events. I'm going to click and drag when space key press. Drag it all the way over here. Now, instead of space key, I wanted the S key to be pressed. So I'm going to click on space. Scroll all the way down to S, click on that, and now when S key is pressed, I want certain movements to happen. The first thing that I want to happen is I want Sarah to point in the down direction, so she'll move in the down direction. I'm going to go into motion on the left hand side. I'm going to go to point in direction 90, just like we had before. 
click and drag that underneath S, click on 90, and I don't want her to point to the right because she's already pointing to the right. That doesn't make sense. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to change the arrow and move it all the way down to 180. This means that Sarah is gonna point downwards. Let's test it out by clicking on the S or clicking on S on your keyboard or tapping on S uh, on the screen itself if you are on a tablet. Boom, Sarah is pointing downwards. Awesome, but not entirely done. Remember, we don't want Sarah to just point downwards. We want her to move downwards. So I'm gonna go ahead, grab a move 10 steps from the motion blocks, click, drag it all the way over here, change 10 steps to 30 steps because if we did 10 steps, it would take a really long time for her to go across the beach. Next, when I now when I click on the S, she moves downwards, which is awesome, but I want her to face back to the right so she's not putting her face into the ground. I'm gonna go ahead, grab in point in direction 90 again, place it underneath the S, and since it's already going in the 90 degree angle, which is to the right, we can just leave it like that. So now when I click on S on my keyboard, Sarah moves downwards and she faces back to the right. So W means up for us, S means down for us, and the next movement we wanna go is right. Thankfully, since Sarah's already pointing to the right, we don't actually need to write a lot of code for this. It's just two lines or two blocks that we're gonna be using. The first block is we want to make sure that when I press the key D on my keyboard, she moves to the right. So we're gonna go into events again. And when space key pressed, we're going to click and drag that into our a workspace. We're, we don't want the space key, we want the letter D. So I'm going to go ahead, click on space, scroll a little bit, find D, click on it. So now when the D key is pressed, we want Sarah to move to the right. Since she's already facing the right, we don't actually need her to turn anywhere, we just need her to move. So I'm going to go into the left hand side, click on the motion tab, grab move 10 steps, Click and drag that underneath the D key. I'm going to click on 10, change it to 30. And now when I click on D, Sarah is going to move to the right. There you go, awesome. So now we have up, down, and to the right. However, we're missing to the left. We don't want Sarah to just continuously go on to the right until we can't see her anymore. So we're going to go ahead and find the events again. On the left hand side, click on the events tab, grab a when space key is pressed, and put it into our workspace. Now for the left uh, key, I want to use the letter A. So we're going to click on the down arrow next to space, click on the letter A, and now uh, when A key is pressed, we want Sarah to move to the left. We're going to do this by going back into motion because we want her to turn. If she just moves from that position, she's going to be, um, you know, just going to the right, just like our D key. So we want her to go to the left, so we're going to have to make her turn. We're going to grab a point in direction 90, click drag that up into here, and we're gonna change it from 90 all the way around to negative 90. This means that Sarah is gonna face the left. In our, um, on our screen, it's gonna look like Sarah's upside down, but that's okay because we're gonna fix it later. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on A, and Sarah's upside down, but she's not moving anywhere. She's just turning upside down. So what we're gonna do is we're going to grab a move 10 steps, pull it all the way down here, change it from 10 to the magic number 30. And now when I click on A, Sarah moves, but she doesn't turn back around. She's still upside down, which is not exactly what we want. 
So we're going to go ahead and click on point and direction one more time. Drag it all the way over here. And we're just going to leave it as 90 because we want her to point back to the right. So now when I click on A, Sarah moves to the left and she goes back to facing to the right, which is exactly what we wanted. So now Sarah can move in all four directions. She can move up with W. She can move down. Sorry, I'll put her more in the middle. <laughs> she can move up with W. She can move down with S. She can move to the right with D. And she can move to the left with A. Now I am clicking on the group of blocks themselves just to show anyone who's using a tablet instead of um, a laptop or a computer that they can just tap on the group of blocks themselves instead of having to find a keyboard attachment for their tablet, which is totally fine. This works completely fine on the tablets. I've done it already. Um, also, if you do have a keyboard, though, it is really easy to click on W and S and D and A to make her move. Now we're going to go ahead and we don't just want Sarah to move, though. That's not really our plan. In our notes, I said that the objective today was to get Sarah to catch a ball, celebrate that she caught the ball, and then have the ball move to a different area so Sarah can go ahead and catch it again. What we're going to do is we're going to create a loop. Now, a loop is commonly used in many coding problems or programs in general if you constantly want to check something. If I had a robot that drove around on the ground and picked up water bottles, um, I would want it to constantly be checking if it sees a water bottle, right? Because maybe there's no water bottles for 5, 10, 20 minutes. And that's okay, because it will constantly be checking just in case there are water bottles. And it touched the water bottle, so it can pick it up and put it in the recycle or something. Um, when we have a loop like that, something that's constantly going over and over and over, um, it's really important that we make sure that we're not actually accidentally going to make it... Um, mess with the rest of our code. So I'm going to show you how to do that in Scratch. We're going to go into Control, this orange circle on the left hand side on this tab. We're going to grab this. Now we are going to grab the forever loop over here and we're going to click and drag it right over here. We don't want it to be connecting to any of our other blocks. These four blocks uh, for our W, S, D, and A, our left, right, up, and down blocks, we want to make sure that they're not touching the forever loop because this forever loop is only going to be checking if Sarah the starfish is touching the ball. Now, the forever loop is only going to be activated or continuously checking if when we're done writing the code for it, we click on it and it's highlighted in the background. When it's highlighted in the background like that, that means it is turned on and it will constantly be checking if whatever code inside is applicable or not, okay? So I'll show you how to do that later. First thing we want to do though is we want to grab an if then statement. It's actually still in our control tab in the orange blocks and it's right here, right underneath the forever. We're going to click and drag this and place this inside the forever loop. So it's like it's like a monster eating another monster right in there. We don't want it to be outside the forever loop because then it's only going to be uh, the forever loop is only going to be activated if the if then is correct. If the condition is true, that's not what we want. We're going to have it. So the forever is giving the if then a hug. Now, remember when I was talking about if then statements earlier today and I said it's like if if there are avocados at the store, grab three and put them in the cart with your mom, right? So we need a condition. The condition is going to fit in this little hexagon 
inside the if then statement. So it's going to be if something, something happens, then we're going to have certain blocks put in underneath that are specific to what happened before. Um, for us, we want to say that if Sarah touches the ball, Sarah the starfish touches the ball, then we want her to celebrate somehow. So I'm going to find a conditional statement for our if our if then statement. I'm going to go ahead and go into sensing the light blue tab on the left hand side. Click on that. I'm going to grab touching mouse pointer, which is the very first block. I'm going to grab it and put it right here so it's highlighted in the hexagon and let go. And it's going to be placed inside of here. Now, we don't want it to be if Sarah is touching the mouse pointer. We want it to be if Sarah is touching the ball. So I'm going to go ahead, click on the arrow here, change it so it says ball. So now this bit of code says if Sarah the starfish is touching the ball, then we want some celebration to happen inside here, okay? Uh, one thing, just to make sure that we all caught earlier, is that right now I have all my code with Sarah the starfish in the upper corner right here, in the upper right-hand corner. This means that all of this code only pertains to Sarah. So when I click, click W, the ball doesn't move too because it's only Sarah that's moving. This is only her code. So inside the if then statement, if Sarah is touching the ball, then we want some celebration to happen. What's really fun about Scratch is that we can actually use sounds. I talked about it a little bit earlier, but now we're actually going to use one. So go into the right, the left hand side, click on sound, which is the pink circle. And we're going to click and drag the first block, play sound, collect until done. Click, oops, click and drag this inside the if statement. So it should look like that, okay? Now, this is great, right? We have it so that if Sarah touches the ball, then it's going to play the sound collect until done. Um, I could try it right now just to show you guys what that would sound like, but we're actually gonna change the sound in just a bit. Oh, I caught my own mistake. I need to double check that I need that if I want to run this code with the forever loop turned on, I have to click on the forever loop. So it has this yellow highlight around it. That way you know that the program is running with the forever loop turned on. So it's going to be constantly checking to see if you if Sarah the starfish is touching the ball. I'm going to go ahead and touch the ball. It's a very, very light little sound that is not very exciting. That's not a celebration sound to me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and change the sound. I'm just gonna click on that so it's not highlighted anymore because we're not testing it anymore. Um, at the beginning, I said that sounds can actually be adjusted or added in the, up, in the upper left-hand side next to the code tab. This is where we're doing all our programming. Uh, you can also change later on if you want to play uh, with Scratch on your own. You can change the costumes, uh, which is just different like faces that your starfish can make. And this is all different for every different uh, character you have. But we're actually going to go into the sounds tab up here and click on that. We have this very tiny little collect sound that's not very interesting to me at least. So I'm actually going to delete it. Click, go up here and click on the delete button. And now we don't have any sounds, which is not what I wanted. I'm going to go into the lower left hand side and click on choose a sound. Click and there you go. We're going to have all these different options. There's a lot of different things going on here. You can get certain um, like certain notes played by specific instruments, which is actually really cool, which um, you can definitely do on your own. We're not actually gonna do that now. I know one of my friends in uh, high school actually made like a song with all the scratch sounds, which is really cool, but we don't have enough time for that today. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we're gonna go ahead and scroll all the way down until you find the letter T. Because it's alphabetical, it's gonna take a, a bit of time and boom. So this is the T section. We're gonna use the sound to da. I'm gonna click on that. And I'm gonna click on the play sound just to let us hear it. Yay, okay. Um, this is 2.53 seconds long. That might not sound very long to you, but it's actually really long because this map is not super big. And Sarah's gonna be able to move and touch the ball again before the sound is over, which is not great because it could cause some problems with how our code is being used. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on the faster button, which is the first one right next to the play button. I'm gonna click on that four times and it's gonna make it a lot faster. So one, two, three, and four. So now it's a lot higher pitched, um, but it's only 1.01 .01 seconds long, which is a lot faster than it was before. So I'm gonna go back into our coding section. Um, at the upper left-hand side, I'm gonna click on the code tab. Now we're back to our regularly scheduled programming and we're gonna go ahead and go into our forever loop. We're gonna find if touching ball, then play sound collect till done. We're gonna change collect and click on the down arrow and change it to ta-da. There you go. Now I'm going to test it out. I'm gonna click on the forever loop until it's highlighted. I'm gonna go ahead and move and touch the ball. It was exciting for a moment and then I realized nothing's gonna happen with the ball. We don't have any code written for it at all. So the ball's just gonna stand there and Sarah can move around and do whatever she wants and touch the ball on every side. But it's not super exciting because the ball's not moving. That's what we're gonna work on next. We're done with all of Sarah's um, instructions. All of her code has been written. She could move around. She can uh, play the ta-da sound when she touches the ball so she can celebrate. But now we need the ball to move after Sarah touches it. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go into the lower right-hand side Click on ball, so we're writing code for the ball. We're gonna double check this by looking at the corner up here and seeing that the ball is in the corner. So we know that this is code specifically for the ball. What we're gonna do is we're going to, we want the ball to move only if it is being, if it was touched by Sarah. So we actually had a very similar loop and if statement that we use with Sarah. We can take a look at it really quick. We have a forever loop, an if then statement with a condition and some code inside. So let's go ahead and go back to the ball. We have this huge blank space and the ball is in the upper right hand corner. We're going to click on control on the left hand side. Click there. We're going to click and drag the forever loop into our workspace. So now we have that forever loop going. So when we click on it and it's highlighted, it will constantly be looping the code inside. Now we're going to click and drag an if then statement inside. And remember, we don't want it on the outside of the forever loop. We want it on the inside, just like that. Now, if we want to see if the ball is touching the starfish, Sarah the starfish, we want a condition, right? That's what needs to be inside this dark space in the if then statement. So we're gonna go into sensing one more time, the light blue circle on the left hand side, click on that tab, and we're actually going to use the same block we used last time, touching mouse pointer, click, drag, and place that inside the condition. I'm just kind of placing it right here. Boom, so it's going to be inside uh, the if then statement. Now, I don't wanna use mouse pointer. That's 
not what I want to see if the ball is touching. I want to see if the ball is touching Sarah, the starfish. So I'm going to press the arrow down and I'm going to change it to starfish. So now the question is, in a forever loop, if the ball is touching the starfish, then we need some code inside. I don't really want to make it the ball move only a little bit so Sarah's just kind of chasing it because eventually it would run into the screen, right? What we can do instead is actually use one of Scratch's pre-coded blocks inside our statement. So in motion, in the motion tab, I am looking down and I find go to random position. This is going to get the ball to move to a random position on the map so that Sarah has, you as the player of Sarah, have no idea where it's going to go to, but it will be in the map so Sarah can still reach it. I'm going to click and drag go to random position, place it inside the if statement, and let's test it. I'm going to click on the forever loop first so it's nice and highlighted. Make sure that Sarah the Starfish forever loop is also highlighted. And I'm going to go ahead and use my keyboard to move Sarah around. She caught the ball. Now the ball is in a completely different position. Let me actually really quickly just move my uh, myself on the screen so you can see the map a little bit better. Sarah is going to go ahead and go upwards to catch the ball again. It moves to a completely different position. She's going to go ahead and catch it again. Again, moves to a completely random position. And this is just how you'd make a really simple um, game where you learn how to use different keyboard movements to make different motions. You know how to use loops and if-then statements. And there are a ton of other, hold on, let me just move myself back again so I can use, I can show you guys this side of the screen. Um, there are a ton of other conditions that you can use that are in the sensing area when there are different questions. Basically, you know, Scratch really there puts no limit to your imagination. You can do a lot of different things. You can take your time and work on one really long project. You can make a bunch of little tiny projects. And especially if you have an account or you've downloaded it because it's free, um, you can save all your projects. And that's really helpful, especially if you want to look back on your code. Um, I highly suggest that you make sure you have this downloaded or at least you have an account where it's saved to your account because um, having your old code and being able to look back on what you've done before is really helpful to grow as a programmer and to learn more as well. Um, I have a challenge for any students that really want to go above and beyond with this. Um, I encourage you to try and, using, try and use variables, create a variable, um, and make it so that variable starts off at zero and every time Sarah catches the ball it goes up by one which would be using set my variable to zero and then change my variable by one um, I really think you guys would have fun with this I think it'd be a nice challenge to really get you thinking about it remember if you have any questions or if you'd like help uh, please do not be afraid to reach out we have Facebook Instagram, our website, our email uh, that you guys can contact. And also if hopefully your parents are still watching, um, we would really appreciate um, any donations that you guys might be able to uh, donate <laughs> basically. Um, I myself, I'm a volunteer and we have other volunteers who are also producing content. And um, it's really fun and it's really, you know, satisfying to be able to make these curriculums. But it also takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Um, so if you guys can uh, donate, that would be really awesome. Uh, is there anything else that we need to go over? Yeah, just one other point on the uh, donation. So I do want to add as well that not only are all of our volunteers uh, just that, but they are 
uh, not paid volunteers. They're doing all of this just because all of us on the, within the STEMS Grow organization are ex feel very passionate about science outreach and inspiring curiosity and scientific confidence really in uh, K through five students. So this is why, this is really what drives all of our activities. So if you did consider donating, uh, all donations are tax deductible as well because we are a charitable uh, 501c3 organization. Um, so thank you uh, for considering donations. Uh, you can donate through our website. Um, if you go to the donate page, there's a link to our PayPal. So it is a secure transaction. Um, so please consider donating. And that's all we'll say about that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention as well is we are going to be sending out a survey. And I know one thing that Emiko has said that she's very interested in, and we would certainly love for uh, her to offer this to the community, which is to continue these coding lessons more as like a series of lessons as opposed to the, just this one moment in time introductory lesson. So if you would be interested in seeing more advanced uh, lessons so that we can try out a lot of the different features that are available on the Scratch platform, we'll ask those questions in the survey and really do uh, welcome and appreciate your feedback. Again, you can also access uh, Emiko's notes uh, by just providing your email address in there. Um, what else? Anything else? I can't think of anything else. Yeah, I just, I guess I just want to thank everyone for watching and for tuning in. Um, again, if you're watching this recorded, thank you very much uh, for watching. I hope that you, uh, you know, or uh, parents, I hope that your children will continue to use this platform. I think it's a fantastic platform. I actually didn't, I wasn't really familiar with it until Emiko told me about it. And uh, my kids have been using it. It's, uh, I will absolutely be having them continue to do this uh, over the summer. And I, I, I don't think it's going to be a battle either. I think they'll really <laughs> enjoy it, <laughs> which is always nice, right? <laughs> so again, thank you all for watching. Um, feel free to um, ask any questions through one of the many channels that are available to uh, contact us. And um, I think that's a wrap. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.